Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your where you are. I'm Maria Heiler, Deputy Director of the Washington, D.C. Office and Senior Researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. I want to welcome you to this one-hour webinar on how investing in teacher and leader professional development can support student success. I'd like to begin by thanking our co-hosts, the American Federation of Teachers, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, the National Association of Secondary School Principals, the National Educational Association, and the School Superintendent Association. During today's webinar, our goal is to share and discuss evidence-based best practices of teacher and leader professional development and why it is so critical to student success. States are currently in the process of planning for ESSA implementation and incorporating evidence-based practices to improve instructional leadership, instructional and leadership quality with the goal of ensuring that all students are fully prepared for college and career. This conversation is particularly important given the continuing threats to cut Title II funding, which is the primary source of federal support for states and districts' efforts to improve educator quality. So our webinar today will feature a presentation from our recent LPI report on effective professional development, a discussion with three expert panelists, and about 10 minutes or so for audience Q&A at the close of the webinar. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A box on the right side of your screen and to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag, hashtag invest in educators. I will turn now the webinar over to Madeline Gardner, Research and Policy Associate at Learning Policy Institute. Great, thank you so much, Maria, and hello, everyone. So today I'm going to be sharing some insights from research, recent research on effective teacher and leader development. And this presentation is based on a couple of recent LPI reports, all of which are available online. But before I begin, I'd like to recognize the other authors who have been involved in this research. Linda Darling-Hammond, Maria Heiler, who's with us today, Danny Espinoza, Ann Podolsky, and Lee Fletcher. So as these recent headlines demonstrate, there's really been an active conversation this year about both the value and the design of teacher and leader development. And fortunately, research has provided us with some insights on these types of questions. So as you'll see in this presentation today, I'm going to first discuss what we know about effective teacher professional development and then leaders. But there are many through lines and similarities between both sets of findings. So let's start with teachers, often considered the most important in-school factor related to student success. And the research that I'm about to describe looks specifically at in-service professional development after teachers are already in the classroom, and specifically at programs that have been shown to have positive impacts on student learning. So while it's certainly true that some professional development for teachers is not of high quality, we've learned a lot in recent years about what makes some PD programs more effective for teacher and student learning than others. Traditionally, teacher professional development has often been lecture-based, what we might call sit and get or drive-by learning, that really offers the same content and strategies to all teachers, regardless of their previous skills and experiences. It's also tended to be largely divorced from teachers' day-to-day -day practices in their classrooms. But rigorous research indicates that professional development programs with an impact on student learning follow a different model that's defined by seven core elements. So those seven core elements are, first, a content focus. Strong professional development is focused on the content that teachers are teaching in their classrooms every day. Programs might demonstrate this when, for example, they offer opportunities for teachers to construct lessons and units for a new curriculum, or to investigate how their stu students learn specific concepts in a subject area. The PD is also active, so unlike lecture-based or sit-and-get professional development, active learning offers teachers a chance to meaningfully engage with new concepts and teaching strategies by actually doing them. So active learning strategies might include analysis, discussion, observation, or even direct practice of certain skills. 
it's also collaborative. And this collaboration can take many forms, with teachers working one-on-one -on -one with a coach in a small group, or even as part of a professional learning community that extends beyond their school. And this can occur remotely, using technology, or in person. But across the board, this collaboration often occurs in job-embedded contexts, so teachers are allowed to plan together, offer each other feedback, and problem solve specifically about their students and the work that they're doing every day. The fourth key feature is models and effective modeling. By providing teachers with models of effective teaching, professional development offers educators a clear vision of best practices. And there are many types of models that can be employed to accomplish this purpose, such as curricular resources, that would be lesson and unit plans, student work, teaching cases, or observations of peer or master teachers. Effective professional development programs also offer coaching or other expert support to help facilitate teacher learning. These experts are typically educators themselves and often lead teachers through the active and engaging learning experiences that we've been discussing. But importantly, they also tailor specific advice and counsel to the needs of the individual teachers with whom they're working. Rather than providing a one-size-fits-all experience, this type of coaching enables programs to meet individual teachers where they are at and support their improvement. This type of coaching often entails feedback and reflection on teacher practice, but we found that powerful teacher learning opportunities, really regardless of the format they employ, offer opportunities to engage in these um, activities. And while these practices are distinct, they often work together to support teachers as they move towards the expert visions of practice that have been previously articulated in their professional development. And finally, we know that accomplishing all of this takes time, so effective professional development must be of sustained duration to be effective. Research has not offered any magic number of hours to create an effective program, and instead indicates that providing opportunities for teachers to study deeply and then apply their learning in cycles of inquiry over time is essential. So often this might involve an intensive workshop that sets teachers up to apply new approaches in the classroom and then provides opportunities for teachers to reconnect, debrief, and problem solve together. Even the best designed professional development may encounter challenges with implementation that limit its effectiveness. So for example, there are any number of school level challenges that have been shown to be obstacles to effective professional development. One common one is inadequate resources. This includes financial support, but also materials such as equipment for lab experiments or project-based learning. Teachers may also contend with a limited opportunity to use their newly acquired, acquired knowledge in their classroom. So in one study we reviewed, for example, a teacher received professional development related to science instruction only to have time for science removed from the schedule entirely. School culture can also prove a deterrent to effective professional development. So for example, in one school we read about, there was a high level of mistrust between teachers and leaders, and therefore the leadership lacked buy-in to the mandated professional development that was being offered to the teachers. And this is one reason that school leadership, which I'll talk about in just a couple minutes, is so essential to this formula. But challenges to implementing effective PD extend beyond the school and the classroom as well. So this might mean a lack of alignment between what teachers feel they need to learn to best meet their students' needs and the initiatives and priorities of the district that they work in. Likewise, there may be a disconnect between state and local policies. So for example, states generally require seat time for recertification for teachers, which in turn might encourage districts to organize one-off workshops that are fairly easy to schedule and might require less time, um, human and financial resources than do evidence-based approaches to PD. Relatedly, few states and districts have robust tracking systems for PD. That includes both quality as well as quantity of the professional learning opportunities offered to instructors. And without these kinds of systems in place, it can be really hard to adopt and implement professional learning for teachers. It's both evidence-based and designed to overcome these types of obstacles. Fortunately, all of these challenges can be addressed both through thoughtful policy and more strategic implementation. And these policy implications are all described in more details in the paper, which is available online. Um, but for today, we just want to preview a few of them. So states and districts could make it easier to offer teachers professional learning that's evidence-based by adopting standards for that learning that can gu guide the design, evaluation, and funding of professional development. 
They might evaluate and redesign the use of time in school schedules to increase opportunities for collaboration or expert coaching. And really key to this are leaders that understand and have the skills necessary to undertake organizational redesigns, which we'll talk about in just a bit. They might also conduct needs assessment to identify what teachers feel they need to, to learn to help their students learn or identifying expert teachers as mentors and coaches. They might also integrate professional learning into SS school improvement initiatives, such as using student data to inform instruction or creating positive and inclusive learning environments. Particularly in rural areas, though certainly not limited to those areas, they might provide technology facilitated opportunities that help provide coaching and collaboration using Titles 2 and 4 of ESSA. And finally, they might consider providing flexible funding and continuing education units for learning opportunities that are sustained and high impact rather than traditional workshops. So while it's crucial to support teacher learning, we also know that school leadership is highly influential. In fact, it's the second most important in-school factor for student success after teachers. Yet many principals find themselves unsupported in their schools. For instance, they might lack the support of any assistant principals due to budget cuts or competition for limited funds. And though investing in principles is a strategy for promoting student success, providing training and support for these leaders is often overlooked in discussions about school improvement. So before diving into the features of effective programs to train leaders, I want to take just a couple minutes to talk more about the key role that they play in our schools. So first, research has shown that principal stability is a factor in student success. So principals who remain in their school are associated with improved student achievement as compared to principals who churn in and out more frequently. Yet a recent analysis of a federal survey of principals and teachers found that in the U.S., one in 10 principals, or about 11%, want to leave the profession as soon as possible or when a more desirable job opportunity comes along. Principals can also improve teacher retention. So a recent LPI review of research affecting teachers' professional decisions found that principal quality is consistently one of the most important reasons that teachers cite in their decision about whether to stay or leave the given school or profession. So this table shows some of the reasons that teachers cited for why they voluntarily left the profession. You can see here that over one in five said that dissatisfaction with administration contributed to their decision to leave. And many of the other reasons on this list, things like student discipline problems and lack of influence over school policies, are also things that principals influence. And that's because effective principals drive whole school improvement by undertaking a number of important practices, including, as you can see here, developing their teachers and other people in the school. As a result, investing in principals can be a very cost-effective strategy because they have a very widespread impact across the school. And as we know, states can make investments in principals by using Title II funds, including a 3% leadership set aside. And for those of you that are interested, there is a brief on LPI's website that offers some examples of how states are planning to use that set aside to support their leaders. So as with teachers, research has provided some insights about the features of strong programs that can help to guide these investments in school leaders. We know that professional development pr for principals can be effective under certain conditions, and unsurprisingly, there are a lot of similarities between teacher and leader development programs that show benefits for students and schools. So specifically, researchers found that effective professional development programs for principals first and foremost establish partnerships with schools and districts that can help align content and recruit promising candidates. They utilize cohorts and networks to promote deep collaborative learning, again, a common feature of effective teacher and principal programs. They also use applied learning, including internships and on-the-job coaching, that helps to engage educators in learning that's relevant and transferable to the real-world context of the schools that they work in. And finally, they have curriculum or content that's focused on what matters for school improvement, things like instruction, organizational change, and using data for change. So these four elements really work together in unison to support the development of strong principles. So to close out, I want to give an example of what these features might look like in practice through a principal residency. So instead of what's common in most principal preparation programs, a residency places an aspiring principal directly under the wing of an expert principal on day one. This way, candidates take classes while also experiencing the daily demands of being a principal, and they do it with the support of an experienced school leader who can model strategies and coach them.
Principals often report that this coaching and guidance is among the most valuable learning opportunities that they have, but it's also the one that they are perhaps least likely to experience in many states. In the best programs, principal learning is also supported both during candidacy and even after the awarding of a credential in the form of on-the-job coaching or mentoring. And it's for principals of all levels of experience that this coaching and mentoring supports them in fostering school improvement, adopting new leadership methods, and continuously improving. So in the end, both teacher and principal learning are part of a broader system that seeks above all to really benefit students. And investing in these types of research-based practices using federal funds is one really promising way for states and districts to support their learners well. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn things back to Maria. Thank you, Maddie. As a quick reminder to the audience, um, please ask questions or engage in discussion by using the Q&A box in the right side of your screen and use the hashtag invest in educators on social media. So um, now we'd like to engage our panelists in a discussion given these research findings and the brief, uh, a brief introduction of them. We have with us today, Dr. Cade Bumley, the superintendent of DeSoto Parish School System in Mansfield, Louisiana. Michelle Dickey, a teacher in the District of Columbia Public Schools, Washington, D.C., and professional development trainer for the Washington Teachers Union. And Kath Nelson, elementary lead learner for the Visai Elementary Schools in Visai, Oklahoma, and Zone 8 director for the National Association of Elementary School Principals. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to just get started by asking you all um, a question and please include in um, your answer a little bit about the work that you're doing. We heard about the seven elements that inform effective teacher PD and the elements of effective leadership preparation, but could you describe what those elements might look like when implemented in a program or initiative at the district, school, or classroom level? Kate, can you go ahead and get us started? Hey, thank you. Um, I think that there's broad agreement that the um, elements of professional development are needed, but there's just uh, still exists some confusion or challenges on how to actually deliver an effective professional development model. Um, you need to be able to deliver a model that's not disconnected from the teacher's needs, is clearly linked um, to student learning goals or outcomes, and you want to be sure that you're always focused on individual uh, needs of, of students. So I find it odd that in districts where possibly 60, 70, 80, even up, upwards of 90 percent of uh, the district's budget goes into uh, talent or educators or staff, that we don't really uh, spend enough time trying to solve this problem. So I, I appreciate um, the work uh, that's taking place here today. Um, in DeSoto, where we've had uh, significant results over the last few years, uh, we partnered with the National Institute of Excellence in Teaching, or NIET, to implement the TAP model in our system. Uh, it provides an instructional infrastructure um, for our teachers so that they might become uh, better at honing uh, their craft so that their students might, might grow. Um, this includes constant job-embedded professional development. It includes support from master and mentor teachers. Uh, it, it includes uh, constantly looking at how to best um, uh, deliver the content that students need as well as the best uh, strategies. Great. Thank you. Michelle? Yes. Um, what I um, think that there has to be a connection on all levels with district, school, or classroom. It can't be just removed. And with the district, if they could come in and kind of do a, um, a needs analysis um, with the local schools, that way they can see what the schools need. Because even in D.C., we have over 100 schools, and the needs are so unique at the school level that the district, it would be helpful if the district came in to assess those needs. And that way, the professional development can be tailored, and sometimes that may lead to the collaboration that we need between schools. There could be six or seven different schools with those same needs, and we could come together at specific times to actually go through what we need for professional development so our students could be successful, and of course, so our teachers can be master teachers. And then when we come back to the local school, 
again, you can have five or six different classrooms in a school that have different individual needs based on the students because we have such a vast variety of students. And on that class school and classroom level, it's the school, again, just doing a needs analysis, coming in, observing, seeing what's really needed, and seeing who can do um, pair together, who can work together. Is it a school-wide problem? Maybe it's just this classroom needs this, and just tailor that professional development. And if you use the seven um, features of the effective professional development, put it together and let it be job embedded. Not just in quote job embedded, but really come in with the coaching, come to observe, follow up, quality feedback, and just have it ongoing. And the timeline, while I know research doesn't give a specific timeline, but at least set times where we check in, evaluate, reevaluate to see if it's working, because if it's working, you can easily move on to another strategy or something else that's needed. And if it's not, you can come back and revise. That way we can make sure that we're maximizing our student achievement. Thank you, Michelle. And Kat? Thank you, Maria. It is a great pleasure for me to discuss the importance of effective professional learning for both teachers and principals. And as the lead learner at my school, which really describes what I do as a principal, I am the lead learner. This is an issue that I take very seriously because of the impact that, that leaders have on improving student outcomes. And I really agree a lot with what Michelle said about let's make it really job embedded. And, I, and I'm just going to bounce off of what she said because it's a lot of what I had already thought out. So, Michelle, you and I are right on here. I like the, um, the fact that we need to check in high quality professional development as we discussed or as, as we learned earlier in the presentation is not a sit and get, it's not a one time, but teachers need to have that time. And if they are managing effectively a, a chunk of their professional learning or a strategy that they're implementing, then by all means that check-in is so important um, just so that they can move on and continue to learn and grow. Um, and specifically in my school, you know, these, these seven elements look differently across states and even districts. But in my school, for example, um, we have a professional learning community and we've identified literacy as a common student learning need at my school. And with that, teachers are able to come together and then principals are able to come together and discuss how we're working school-wide and across grade levels to address the various challenges in that particular area. So this is how we start with a shared vision in our school and continue on through improvement. Thank you. Michelle, you shared a little bit about what's going on um, within your school. Can you share a little bit uh, about how the professional development you've experienced have, has reflected the elements and what your personal experience with PD has been, especially how your learning and experiences from programs have improved your practice and student learning? Thank you. Yes, I am very fortunate to be at a school where the leader is very into effective professional development. Our district gives a guide of what they want professional development to be. They give a great um, skeleton for you to work with. But she actually tailors it and she allows the coaches in the build building to tailor the professional development. So prime example, last year I was in a part, a part of a cohort for literacy. Um, our focus was writing. So we had a new teacher, I'm a 17-year vet, we had another teacher over 25 years experience and the collab, and excuse me, a first-year teacher. So the collaboration between us and bouncing off of each other, things that I did not know that the 25-year-old, 25 25-year 25 vet did, that helped me out because some of my students were having problems with, let's say, informative writing. And the strategies that were given, it helped me out. Also, when you make it job embedded, we were required to bring in student work because we know the ultimate goal is for our students to be successful. We took the student work and got different perspectives because sometimes as a teacher, I will admit, you like, I know this, what this child can do. So you may be a little subjective, but having those other eyes who have that common vision, like Cass said, the same vision, common vision, looking at the work, using specific standards and rubrics to address it, it really 
helped out a lot. The coach came in and she really, she really tailored it to you. So what she came in my classroom for, I could have been struggling with something and needed help with a concept. She didn't have to go in someone else's classroom to do because they had a different thing, strategy that they needed to work with. So just to see that model go on, it wasn't perfect, but we're still building upon it. And this year we're starting out fresh and they've even divided it even more because they were they realized that they needed to divide it and put people on different pathways. So our pathways were the general pathway was chosen, but now we actually get to individually choose a pathway that we would like to go. And the district is also mimicking that with pathways that they're doing. So with that being said, my students, I just looked at park scores that they had, and I had students that honestly, I projected that they may have scored a level two, maybe a level three, and they were on level fours. And that actually is a reflection of what I learned in my professional development at the school because it was tailored to me. It wasn't just something to just to give to me, something that I already mastered and didn't know. It took where I needed improvement and it targeted that. And that really improved my students' practice. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, I can even hear the excitement in your voice when you think about the learning opportunities you've had. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'd like to switch a little bit now to um, Kate and Kathy. You've actually provided professional development to teachers. So could you talk a little bit about your approach um, to providing PD and how that approach has re reflected these elements? And can you share some of your personal experiences in selecting and um, deciding which PD and how to um, implement that PD, especially your learning and experiences from the PD that you received? And how has that improved your practice and student outcomes? Sure, I can go ahead and speak to that just a little bit. Um, this is Kath, and the effective indicators that we've talked about, you know, being collaborative, content-focused learning, that is sustained and applied through active learning and implementing proven models of success are all part of, like I spoke about earlier, the shared vision around continuous improvement and achieving excellence. And my role, I am the principal of the school. I am the lead learner. So it's my responsibility to engage in learning with or alongside my teachers, providing the coaching and support, um, the instructional feedback or reflection, and offer opportunities for that, offer opportunities for doing just that, for offering or for reflecting and giving feedback. Um, this is how teachers and principals fit together. Uh, hand in hand, I think, not one over the other or not one or the other, but that's why being a leader, having, having strong leadership skills and having some high quality professional development as a leader is second only to effective teaching in the classroom when you look at the factors that relate to student achievement like we discussed earlier. Um, professional opportunities for learning may look different according to which strategies we are pursuing. Some may be school-wide at my school, others are more focused on specific grade levels or specific learning goals, but the elements of learning present themselves in our school through a variety of ways. Um, some of the things that, or some of the high quality offerings that we have seen really be very effective would be mentoring. Um, teachers, pairing teachers with each other, letting them do some peer observations. Um, other things such as high quality book studies. We've chosen books that not only relate to our focus, which is literacy, but we've also chosen books that discuss, um, um, let's see, just creating a culture, creating a, a good school culture. So those, are, those have also proven to be very helpful for our teachers. We collaborate with each other, not just um, not just face to face, not just through collaborative meetings, but we also utilize technology. We utilize apps such as Padlet, where teachers are able to give each other feedback or leave each other messages or simply communicate about about different goals through technology. Those are just a few. Thank you, Cass. I really like the fact that uh, your title is lead learner. Um, as a principal that really gets at the heart of this work around professional learning, not just for teachers, but leaders as well. And so 
um, that's a great example of how the culture of um, where you're at is really focused on the learning and the development of all of the um, stakeholders in the community. Cade, can you share a little bit about what's going on in DeSoto? Yes, thanks. Um, you know, we we tell prospective teachers that if they think that they've already arrived, that DeSoto is not the place for them. Uh, in in fact, if if a teacher wants to hone their craft and, and be excellent, uh, DeSoto Parish School System is the is the place uh, to work. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, and and, and the buzzword is uh, organic. Things are organic, but I think in terms of professional development. Uh, that's not good enough. I think, I think that in terms of professional development, you have to be very strategic in what you're trying to accomplish. And it's an old term, but backwards design still works. Uh, we think about uh, where we want our students to ultimately be, and then we plan to get there given the amount of time and resource that we have uh, to make that happen. So, for instance, in, in DeSoto, um, we have leadership teams at both the district and the school level. And at the school level, those are focused uh, primarily on content. And so math teachers in a high school will cluster together every week for 90 minutes uh, in professional development, math teachers, ELA teachers, science. Um, and in elementary, that's basically done on a, uh, on a grade level basis. And they plan together. They look at student work and data points together. They, they talk through how, how support might be beneficial to them and what support they might need. And they really, um, really focus on content and trying to understand uh, what are the standards, what the standards actually mean through a real uh, solid deconstruction process of the standards so that they know what students need to know. And, and beyond that, they know what the students know when they're supposed to uh, know those things. Um, give you a brief example. This year with our principal group, uh, we're focused on academic feedback. So something very specific. Uh, we found that academic feedback is very inexpensive, but at the same time, research will show you that it gives you a great bang for your buck. And um, so we're trying to, to work with our principals to understand what academic feedback and feedback in general might look like from the district to the principal, what feedback mm -hmm. might look like from the principal to the teacher, and what that might look like from the teacher to the student. And we believe that with the, the laser focus that we have on academic feedback, for a very low cost, will make a tremendous difference in the lives of our students. That's fabulous, Kate, especially that, that sense of cohesion that everyone is doing it at every level, at the district level, at the school level, all the way down to the class level. So um, that's really impressive of how it's not only work, working in the academic sense, but also in building the culture and the cohesion across levels. Thank you. So one of the primary purposes of ESSA is to improve educational opportunities and outcomes for historically underserved students and close gaps in those opportunities and outcomes as well. What is the role of educator and leader quality and professional development in fulfilling that purpose? Um, Kate, we're gonna go ahead and start with you again and then Michelle and Cass, if you could join in. Thanks. Yeah, um, ESSA will do something that hasn't really happened before, and that's illuminate results within subgroups that truly need to be illuminated. Uh, for instance, in DeSoto Parish, one of the um, subgroups that we're really looking at moving forward, as, as are many districts, is our special ed uh, student population. And my question, essentially, to uh, stakeholders within our school community, including uh, our educators, was, you know, why are our special education results not mirroring the tremendous results we're seeing in, in regular ed? And so I conducted a number of interviews with um, educators, students, parents. We held uh, two different think tank groups within the system to uh, develop a redesign for our special ed uh, programming. And as, as we worked through that, as we triangulated all the information that we had uh, available, we really came to the idea that we need to understand that um, we need to move from a deficiency model to a proficiency model. And we also grew to understand that we need to mirror the same things that are taking place in regular ed with our special ed population targeted uh, to those teachers. So uh, truly for the first time, uh, sadly, but truly for the first time in, in our district, our special education uh, teachers and, and other associated educators will be receiving professional development that is directly targeted to them. So in the past, unfortunately, in our district and in others, uh, special ed teachers would have to, have to hop in uh, to a professional development session with, say, an English teacher or a math or, 
wherever they might be more comfortable or, or they fit best. But in DeSoto this year, we're actually targeting support um, in a number of different ways to help our special ed teachers help those uh, students grow. And so I think that that's one of the positives of the new ESSA is just the fact that it will illuminate uh, some of these subgroups like never before, and it's our responsibility as um, educators to respond to that accordingly uh, to meet the needs of our students. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, um, and I'm glad to hear what they're doing in DeSoto because, again, same here, the special education teachers were lumped in professional developments with us. In some places, it was appropriate and sometimes not. Here in D.C., the achievement gap, it's been widening for a while. We're seeing small um, where it's decreasing a little bit, but still not to the degree that I think it should, and I don't think anyone else thinks it should. It's... Um, with ESSA happening, you're going to have to target the professional development. Um, like he said, subgroups, they need to be disappearing. And the biggest thing that I saw with improvement with um, our special ed subgroup at our school is um, when they actually did a true model where it's a push-in model, so they would get, of course, the core instruction from the classroom teacher and the special education teacher came in for that targeted support. And if everyone is trained in that model, it even works works with general education students so that we can push these gaps and close the achievement gaps. Something else that could be helpful with professional development is sometimes it's different cultures have different gaps. So my, I myself I'm, uh, have multicultural students, so I try to learn as much about their culture so that way I can reach them that way, which helps to also reach them academically. And I think that should be included also with the professional development when states are writing their ESSA plans and what they're doing to adhere to it. Because as long as we, we're not doing that targeted instruction, targeted professional development to develop the quality teachers and student success, the gap will widen, and we need to really close that gap because every student should have the opportunity to make a choice of what they want to do. So I'm just looking at just districts making plans to include what um, is included in effective professional development and making sure that they're targeting every group because no matter, it may end up being a lot, every person is a part of some, it may not be an identified subgroup, but just some group where they actually need that targeted instruction, targeted experiences and teachers need to be able to relate to those students, give them the best education that they need. And when we start talking about things like students who um, are in deep poverty or may have been stuck in the area for generations, maybe drug, alcohol abuse that have that's done things that may we may not be able to actually decipher yet. But if we can get more research with that, that would help us so much with getting professional development to help us with those students with those issues that we have a lot of and we're not doing the best. We're doing the best that we can, but there's a lot more research that should be done so that we can get the PD to help those students immediately. Yes, thank you. There's um just as PD needs to be um, content focused, there's a need to also have trauma informed PD and PD that um, focuses specifically on issues such as cultural competency and um, additional information for educators who are working with our most vulnerable population. Thank you, Michelle. Cass? I absolutely agree with Kate and Michelle and, and just want to reiterate that I heard Michelle say that we are doing our best, but we are not able to do the best for each and every child. And that's how I feel in my state. We are doing the very best that we can, but it, it's not enough. And that's where high quality professional development comes in. And that's where ESSA comes in and targeting each one of those groups. And, and like, like Michelle said, I completely agree. There's We've got to do more. We've got to focus in on each group. Um, just our children deserve it. Our children deserve much better than we're able to give them at this point. But as the lead learner at my school, my role is simply to ensure the equity, that the equity is there. Um, we're working with our state, and our state is working through their ESSA right now, um, or through our ESSA, but just making sure that all students are provided and access to well-rounded and complete education. I think this, this 
this means spending more professional development time with teachers to identify those needs even within our own school and um, just going above and beyond what we have and what we are able to for the sake of each of each child. I think we have to remember that. Thank you, Kath. I, I'd like to um, turn our attention to um, Title II and the fact that many states are relying on Title II Part A funding to improve educator quality and school performance and describing such efforts in their ESSA plans. President Trump and Secretary DeVos have proposed to completely eliminate the $2.1 billion in funding for this program. What is the likely impact the elimination or even the reduction of these funds would have on states as they implement their ESSA plans? Michelle, can you go ahead and get us started? Sure. Um, the elimination of those funds will just leave us in disarray. Um, um, speaking from my district, who was really headed in the right direction, it took a while. It took a lot of let's try this, see if it works. If it doesn't work, let's um, improve it. And I think we're getting it right. But if those funds get cut, we're not going to have the, the master leaders that are leading us, who are giving us the professional development that we need, and the people who are actually coming in to to do those analysis of what we really need. And with that money being gone, and maybe it's, um, the, it's gonna rely on a local school, but the local school budgets are cut every year. Um, and it puts a lot on a leader who really wants their staff to get the best professional development, but unfortunately they may not, with those funds gone, they wouldn't be able to actually support that. So when we look at that, and um, ESSA wants every child to achieve, children, pretty much will be stagnant. Those who can, they will, of course, but it wouldn't be the best quality that we could give. We need the funding because teachers on their own trying to figure out professional development, trying to choose on their own when you can actually give it to a district where they can actually do the research and figure out what we really need and get masters of content to show us what we need to help our students. It's going to end up being just this a school system that fails across the nation. So cutting those funds is really, is going to really eliminate successful students in my opinion. Thank you for that on the ground teacher perspective. Um, Kate, could you t talk about that from the superintendent's perspective? Yeah, thanks. This is actually one of my, my favorite topics. Um, I'll graduate my sixth class as superintendent of the Soto Parish School System uh, this upcoming year. And during that time, that same time period, we've seen about a 40% drop in our overall revenue. So if you just think about the magnitude of that, um, our revenue has been cut in half, essentially, over that same uh, time frame. Uh, however, it's forced us uh, to look at new ways of doing things to be as creative, effective, and efficient as possible. And our, our results uh, show that we've done that well. You know, of, of Louisiana's 70-plus districts, we were ranked 45th just a few years ago, and now we're ranked 14th out of all of those um, systems. Um, we braid as many funds as possible, and our title funds are a valuable uh, piece of that, especially considering that our local dollars uh, continuously seem to erode away. Um, in, in Title II, um, we, we need to be sure that we're advocating uh, to try and get that restored into the budget, and I would just encourage everyone to have conversations with, uh, you know, senators, congressmen, uh, whoever are the, the power players in your area, just so that they undersure, I mean, so they ensure uh, that those funds are, are restored. For us uh, here in DeSoto, we, we built a differentiated compensation package uh, for teachers so that teachers uh, that are teaching in hard to staff areas uh, were market responsive. So high school math, high school uh, science, special education, as well as some of our high need schools were able to provide additional supplements uh, for individuals uh, in those fields. Uh, alongside that, we also use those funds in DeSoto to help with our teacher and student advancement program, our, ta our TAP model, and we use some of those funds to provide uh, substitute teachers, high quality substitute teachers, while our regular ed and special ed teachers are clustering together based on their content. So uh, the funds are used so that, um, so that our, our teachers have time to plan and at the same time kids are, are, are still being serviced by a quality instructor in the classroom. Thank you, Kate. Those, um, that progress that you've um, managed to make is just 
phenomenal. Um, that's great work that you're doing there. Uh, Cass, can you finish us off with the lead learner principal perspective, please? Absolutely. Well, we established that the research shows that teachers and principals are the most impactful on student learning. And so knowing that, how can we not fund high quality professional development for teachers and principals when we know that they make the most impact on a day-to-day -day basis on student learning? As a principal, this funding is critical next to Title I in order to provide effective interventions, professional development, teaching strategies, everything that our teachers and myself need to meet my, our students' learning needs. Um, there simply are not enough funds provided in Title I in, in that section of the law to pick up or for the intended purpose, uh, in that section of the law for the intended purpose and the goal of Title II in ESSA. So I just think it is imperative that we must um, use our voices. And I, I just wanted to briefly share that MAESP, partnering with many, many other entities, is asking for tomorrow, actually on the 29th, on Tuesday, August 29th, join NAESP, NASSP, American Federation of School Administrators. There are a bunch of us who are going to be using our voices to tweet out or to contact lawmakers about Title II. So I just wanted to encourage everyone to follow that conversation as well. Thank you, Cass. We have um, information for that at the end of the um, webinar, so we'll be able to um, give folks a link to that um, event at the end. So I'm just going to ask one quick question to each of the panelists and then go on to our um, audience questions. So Michelle, as a teacher, can you, from that perspective, explain why is effective leadership so important? Yes, effective leadership is just important because we're all stakeholders in this and everyone should share that common shared vision of student achievement. And if we're all sharing a vision that we need to develop our educators, even our paraeducators that are in the school, anyone who works with our students, and we all have that common vision, then we will work together toward that vision. And that comes with a principal who understands the importance of professional development, not saying they were a professional developer before or maybe a coach before, but they've gone through and understand the importance of effective professional development so that students can increase achievement. That trust level has to be there. Shared leadership has to be there. You have to have a principal who stands their ground and is so sound in their position that shared leadership is looked, as a, looked to as a positive and not a threat because shared leadership with all stakeholders, you have so many ideas, so many successful people with a lot of skill, different skill bases. If all of that shared vision comes together and their shared leadership with the common goal of student achievement and producing effective, quality, extraordinary teachers, that is the best. I've worked with a couple of them that when I say shared leadership, they would sometimes put things on the table and we could make those decisions. Of course, they had to approve, but when we made decisions that were best for our students and teachers, it really worked. I'm listening to Cass, I'm listening to Cade, and it seems like they are spearheading that in their districts and schools. And that is what I like to hear. If we can just have that shared leadership going towards student achievement, that leadership is very important because a leader can make a break, unfortunately. And if you have that goal of student achievement, shared leadership, shared vision, shared goals, everything will work out. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Cass, as a principal and lead learner, um, you talked a little bit about this, but could you um, focus in on a particular school-wide or improvement goal um, that strong professional development has helped to articulate coherence across Title I? Do you have a particular example? Sure. As I mentioned, we have been focusing on improving literacy. And the strong professional development that I have received through, um, through various professional developments that, I, that I've been sent to by my district 
that has in turn allowed me to lead that through my school. Um, things like, let's see, well, the same is true for, we would think of this as a student. We would think of this, this example kind of as a student. We don't expect students to meet an objective after we just introduce it. And so the, the fact that the, that the professional development for myself and for my teachers has been ongoing, the fact that we have targeted in on a goal and we continue to move toward that goal, I am able to check in with them. We provide each other feedback. We collaborate. I, I'm hoping that you can hear a lot of those seven effective, um, effective professional development ideas in there because they are so important. But none of that would have happened if I didn't have the leadership mm -hmm. training and professional development as the lead learner of the school. Um, sure, teachers are going to seek out information, and sure, but it takes a leader. It takes the professional development that makes a leader somebody that's able to pull all of that together, somebody who is able to get the building organized and get the teachers on board, build culture, collaborate, provide time for that professional development, um, then on the back end, provide time for it to be implemented. All of that, all of that builds and makes our work toward literacy at our school, toward improving reading um, at our school grow each and every day. And some things that we've found just through the growth of, of our students and our teachers' teaching strategies in their classroom, we are finding that other things are affected through just our cohesiveness as a staff. Our culture is improved. Um, our parent communications have improved. Uh, we're, we're reaching out to parents more, and they're reaching out to us more, which is a great thing. You always want parents to feel welcome and, and part of their child's education, so that's very important. Um, we've noticed that our LEP, or limited English students, their proficiency on the WIDA access test has improved. So there are lots of things that, you know, just focusing in, on a goal and keeping everyone moving forward have, it's kind of a domino effect. Thank you. I think that um, that point about our leaders, you having had the experience of having high quality PD is really important because often leaders who don't have that experience don't know how to identify that or create that space for their own teachers. So I think that's a really important key point that you made. Kate, finally, as a superintendent, why and how have strong professional development opportunities helped with the school-wide or improvement goal to articulate coherence across Title I? Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, this, this just really matters. I, I know it, that, that's simple, but, but professional development that's high quality, job embedded, it really matters, uh, and it matters for, for our students. And, um, you know, there, there are a couple of things I think have made a tremendous difference for us, one of those being strategy and the second um, being talent. And talent is your largest financial investment in your students. And so if you're going to do talent right, then you have to have a plan to make that happen. And so what do educators want uh, in order to, to come to a district or to stay in a district? They, they need an acceptable leader and their school principal. Uh, they need a supportive uh, culture where they can grow and be the best teacher that they can, they can be. And they need a compensation package uh, that makes sense. If I look specifically at number two, a supportive uh, culture for, for growth, I think about our, our TAP model that we uh, deliver to, to guide our professional development processes. Um, and we encourage a growth mindset in all of our educators. And there's a, there's a statement out there, there's a, a question rather, um, what does it take to get there? And we like to, we like to believe in the power of yet, Y-E-T. So we believe that we are who we are not yet. And in the DeSoto Parish School System, we have not arrived, but we will continue to work to be the leaders, to be the learners, to be the teachers that our students need in order to be successful. Great. Thank you so much, Cade. And um, now we've about four minutes left to the webinar, so we want to get to some of the audience questions. So um, we'll start going through and get to many, as many as we can. Um, the first one from um, Larry is, 
to Maddie actually on the research, as opposed to effective structural improvements for admin prep programs, did you investigate in-service supports for principals and instructional leadership? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is Maddie again, chiming back in. Um, and I would say in, in this report on strategies for supporting effective leaders in schools, you'll see there are examples from both in-service and preparation programs. Um, so for example, San Diego Unified has an in-service preparation program that really exemplifies a lot of these um, strategies as well. It includes mentoring and, and networked learning among principals in the district. Um, so if anyone's interested in those types of examples, I'd really encourage you to look through the report because they're definitely in there. And the features that we were describing are certainly, I think, equally valid for both in-service and preparation. Thank you. Um, Kate, a question um, for you from Corey. What advice do you have regarding how a district can track and assess PD quality across schools? Uh, very good. Uh, thank you uh, for the question, Corey. Uh, one of the things that, that I would suggest that any district do is to make sure that they have um, one at the district level who is uh, specifically overseeing the professional development for the district. I would also suggest that the superintendent uh, not be too far away from that, that individual because uh, this, this is the person that's ensuring quality control of all of these practices uh, throughout the district. So for us, we have what's called an executive master teacher. And, uh, and again, you, you, you put your money in terms of your budget uh, in the areas where you think you can do the most good. And so we, we spend a lot of money in professional development in terms of a percentage of our budget. And so our executive master teacher works with our school-based master teachers to make sure that they're planning effectively for leadership team meetings, for clustering, for follow-up support. And so uh, then they, they report back uh, directly to our director of student learning who reports uh, back to me. And we all just hold each other accountable for that work. Excellent, thank you. Michelle, are there any examples of um, needs assessment surveys that state agencies can use to discover the needs of educators? Did you have any surveys given to you? That's a question from Patty. I have had surveys given to me. They were created in-house from um, the local school level. So, um, and also the district was sent a survey that they have an official one that they sent, and I think it may have come from the teacher project, um, surveying um, the needs of the school, where the needs met, those types of things. But our needs assessment from a local school was made locally from my leaders. That's great and actually a good advice for um, how to get the, the types of questions for educators that are very context specific. Um, we actually are out of time for questions, but um, I wanted to remind participants that the slides and a recording of the webinar will be posted on LPI's website afterwards as a resource to you. Um, I can hear the virtual round of applause for all three of our panelists today. Thank you to all of you for participating. Um, if there are questions we'll do, we didn't get to, we'll do our best to get back to you. And the pre presenters have shared their contact information and encourage you to follow up with them directly if they can be helpful. So thank you again for joining this webinar hosted by the American Federation of Teachers, Learning Policy Institute, National Association of Elementary School Principals, National Association of Secondary School Principals, National Education Association, and the School Superintendents Association. We wanted to uh, make you aware of the Title II Day of Action tomorrow, hosted by NAESP and NASSP in support of maintaining Title II funding. You can find more information about this event using the link that just posted in the Q&A box. We'd also like to encourage you to save the date for our next LPI event focused on teacher turnover and what we can do about it uh, on September 19th, and that'll be held in Washington, D.C. You can find the report highlighted, um, for this, uh, highlighted at this event using the link um, that just posted in the Q&A box as well. We hope this webinar was helpful to participants as you consider best practices for teacher and leader professional development. We will post the recording and slides from today's webinar on LPI's website in a day or two and email attendees when they are available. Thank you again and have a great rest of your Monday.